Come up here. Come up here. Oh my. <laughs> I, you know what? Every time the word is preached, there's a response, right? Why not? Come up here. And I don't mean up here. I mean, have a seat up here. Like everybody's way back there. Why not come up here? Oh, Sorry. Come. Sorry. <laughs> I should have been more specific. Uh, that's what you get when you're not <clears throat> when you're not thinking of what it means to other people. So yes, come up here. Absolutely. So now listen to this. This is an opening statement I want you to remember. And if you forget it, then you can listen to it again on the YouTube World Wide Web when you uh, log on to today's service. Listen to this. Whoever and whatever fills your head will fill your heart. And whatever fills your heart will fill your life. Who and whatever fills your head will fill your heart. And whatever your heart is full of is going to fill your life. The Lord wants to fill us with himself. And he invites us to come up here. And it says this in the word of the Lord, come up here with me and I will fill you with my glory. I'm going to read Revelations chapter 1, verse 10. Revelation 1, verse 10. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. I don't know if you've had a chance to read the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, but I, um, I encourage you to read it and ask the Lord, what church am I in? How do you see the church that I attend? And what do you want to do in our church? Because you're a part of the body of Christ. And it says here in Revelation 4, 1 through, 12, 1 through 2, Revelation 4, 1 through 2, it says, after these things I looked. So I had to look at what is after these things. I looked at Revelation 2 and 3. Those are the letters to the church. So this is what John's writing. After these things, these letters, I looked and behold, there was a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So the Lord's always saying, come up here, come up here with me. The things of the earth are passing away. He knows we're in this earth and he knows that we are made of earth because he made us from the earth. But he also invites us to come up here where he is. He is seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And he says, come, I've prepared a place for you next to me. We can be with him. Now, that doesn't mean that our physical body is there in heaven with him, but that means that we rule and reign with him in the spirit up there. And from up there, you're going to see things very different. How many of you have been in a plane and you look down at the ground and you're like, whoa, looks pretty tiny, doesn't it? Can you imagine God's perspective of the earth? It says the earth is his footstool. So he's the Lord God of heaven and earth, of the universe, and he's the Lord God of of us and he is that big and he's that personal at the same time there's only so much our physical body can endure in the presence of the lord and many times when john would write in the book of revelations he'd say i fell down like a dead man i don't know if i was awake or if i was in a vision i don't i can't tell because i was somewhere else and uh, there is so much written about the what's to come in the book of revelation that is hard for us to understand if we're just reading it like a story. We have to read it with the hope that the Holy Spirit is going to give us the understanding. We cannot read the book of Revelation or understand anything about it without the Holy Spirit giving revelation. So he writes this, he says, in verse 2 it says this, I was in the Spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now we can't go to Mars or the moon or somewhere else and find the throne of God. It's not a physical thing, it's in the spirit realm. When we leave our physical body, we are spiritual beings and we will be in the presence of the Lord. So there's a spiritual dimension that's, I will say, veiled from us or hidden from us that we can't see with our natural eyes and we can't enter into because of our physical body. But we can experience it in the spirit. 
So it's very exciting to think that God wants us to experience those things, that he wants to show us things to come and give us revelation. Now in verse 2 through 11, which I'm not going to take time to read because I'm just going to do highlights. This is how it describes the throne. This is what goes on in heaven. First of all, it says there's a rainbow around the throne. Many of you in this generation, young people think the rainbow belongs to the LGBT. The rainbow belongs to God Almighty. There is a throne with a rainbow around it. It says this, 24 thrones clothed, there are 24 elders the throat that are sitting on a throne, clothed in white robes with crowns of gold on their head. From the throne proceeds lightnings, thunderings, and voices. In the throne room there are seven lamps of fire burning, which are the seven spirits of God, a sea of glass like crystal. In the midst and around the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Steven Spielberg has no corner market on the weird things that he can come up with. I can't even comprehend. Listen to this. It says, one is like a lion, a second like a calf, and a third like the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. The fourth living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within and do not rest day and night. I can't even wrap my mind around that. And this is what they say day and night. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things and by you, your will, they exist and were created. How many of you were able to think about the election while I read that? How many of you were able to think about Christmas and shopping and what you have to do when you leave today when I read that? None of us, you know why? We were captured by what is happening in heaven. When your heart is captured, when your mind is captured about what is happening in the spirit realm and in heaven, then everything else on this earth grows dim. It doesn't hold anything on you. It can't keep you. It can't hold you. It doesn't own you. Isaiah writes, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his glory filled the temple. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, I'll read. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. If you've been to a wedding, you've seen the train of the bride, right? The train is the thing that follows after her all the way down, and she usually has somebody holding the train so that she doesn't uh, get wound up in it. And so this is what it says about the Lord. The train of his robe fills the temple. Now, when I first read that, I thought, ah, uh, yeah. So what's that all about? Have no comprehension, right? But here's the thing about the word of God. You are not given understanding if you're a casual reader. If you're reading it like a story, you're not going to have understanding. But if you search out for wisdom of what's written in the book, you will gain wisdom from heaven. God speaks to us by his spirit to those that search out a matter. And so as we searched out, as I searched out with the Holy Spirit's help, I found this out, that every conqueror, every king that won a battle, what he would do is take a, a piece of the robe, of the garment of the king that he conquered, and he would sew it to his robe. So the king of glory has conquered everything that needs to be conquered. And there is a piece or a garment from everything that he conquered, every king that he's conquered, and it's sewed to his robe, and it fills the temple. That's how many He's conquered. He is the conquering king. It's amazing when Isaiah, when, when John, when different ones in the Bible, Ezekiel, saw things in heaven. How do you describe those things when they don't even know how to describe it? They, they did the best that they knew how to describe it in their day with their language. So this is what it says. King Uzziah died. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. 
And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, that's angels. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew and cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me for I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. So Isaiah saw the Lord. And when he saw the Lord, he realized how undone he was and how much he needed healing and cleansing and freedom and forgiveness. And once the Lord cleansed him, then he was able to send him. See, the Lord wants to send us as missionaries to the streets of the cities that we live in. And what does that mean? That you go out on the street with a bag of candy or a bottle of water and try to find people and bless them? Yeah, could be. But it means this, you go to the grocery store, you go to the doctors, you go anywhere and wherever your feet take you, the presence of God is with you. And wherever you go, you share his glory and his peace and his presence with people. Now, if you walk around heavy laden, bowed over, concerned, worried, fretting, anxious, troubled, upset, angry, the glory of the Lord is not seen through you but the humanity of your flesh manifests. God wants to send us out filled with his glory. Ezekiel 43, and I'm gonna take different uh, scripture verses uh, throughout Ezekiel 43. It's too long to read the whole thing, but Ezekiel 43, um, I'll give you the text uh, one through five, verse 10 and 11, verse 23 through 31, and then chapter 44, Verse 23, God's glory returns to the temple. How many of you know you are the temple of the Lord? You are the temple. And this is what it says. Then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The vision I saw was like a vision I had seen when he came to destroy the city and like the visions I had seen by Kibar the river and I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Son of man, describe the temple to the people of Israel that they may be ashamed of their sins. Let them consider its perfection. And if they're ashamed of all they've done, make known to them the design of the temple. Do you know it is the priest's job to make known to you the design of the temple? And yet we don't have a temple today. We have church. The temple, I've actually been to Israel. I've actually seen the temple on, on the Mount, the Temple Mount. And I've seen the setup of how church was set up. So first, or I said temple, I should, but we're the church, so I'm gonna relate it. Here's what it is. There's an outer court. The outer court is where you deal with your sins, where there's a sacrifice made for your sin. We know that Jesus is the sacrifice made for our sin. So the outer court is where you deal with your sins. Now, if we are practicing a lifestyle of sin, because there are multitudes upon multitudes of Christians who do that, they practice a lifestyle of sin. Because after all, the grace of God, I'm forgiven, mercy, mercy, right, Lord? I can live any way I want and I'm still gonna go to heaven. So there's a mentality. So where do they live? They live in the outer courts all the time, just sinning, dealing with sin, going to the altar, asking forgiveness, going back to their sin, going to the altar, asking for forgiveness, going back to their sin. That's the life a lot of people live. They live in the outer courts. And then they say things like, I don't know where God is in the earth today. I, I, don't, I don't feel God's presence. I read the Bible and all I feel is condemned. 
You know, I can't pray. I don't know how to pray. They live in the outer courts, far away from where God wants for them to live, but that's where they choose to live. And you say, oh no, they don't choose to live there. They're forced to live there because they're slaves of sin. Well, Jesus Christ died on the cross to set us free from the slavery of sin. We have to appropriate that. If I told you I have $1 million and I deposit it in your account, and here is the code at the bank to open the account and get the money, would you say, well, why didn't you bring it here and give it to me? No, it's in the bank. Yeah, but I want it here. Why didn't you do it for me? No, you go to the bank. It's in your name. This is your code. Well, I don't want to go to the bank. I, it's going to cost me gas. I mean, just craziness. People have a crazy mentality about the gift that Jesus has given them and every excuse in the book of why they don't receive the gift, which is free, a free gift, but they don't receive it. So they live in this outer court, constantly dealing with sin and shame and condemnation and guilt and back and forth and back and forth. And then they give up after a while. They're like, it doesn't work. I tried Christianity. I tried that Jesus thing and it doesn't work. That's the mentality. But they still call themselves a Christian. So then there's the inner court. The inner court, and I'm not going to do a whole teaching on it, but the inner court is where the lamp, the menorah, the light is, the light of God. The altars are there with the showbread. We would consider that like communion, um, coming into a place of communion with God, receiving from him, understanding a greater level of who he is, walking that out, not living any longer in just the outer courts. Not that you don't have to visit now again, could get things cleaned up because we do sometimes fall short. And then there's another place, it's called the Holy of Holies. That's the place that God wants every one of his sons and daughters to live in. A holy place with him where there's freedom, there's joy, there's peace, there's righteousness. You don't live under condemnation and shame and guilt and constantly go round and round. I've had those round and rounds. I lived there for many years. I'm not condemning or faulting people that live in the round and round like a hamster on a wheel. I'm not condemning. I'm just saying there's more. There's so much more. And I passed through that outer court. And then I came into the holy place and sitting in that place of saying, God, I'm so unworthy to be in your presence. But because of the blood of Jesus, I'm going to stay in this place as your daughter. And I'm going to receive from you all that you have for me and staying in that place and learning to abide in him and learning to receive from him. And when the enemy comes, yeah, well, you this and you that, and look what you did over here. And who do you think you are? I get to say, shut up in the name of Jesus. I don't live out there anymore and I'm not in that circle of sin anymore. I'm in a different place and you have no authority to be here. So go in Jesus name. But now learning to come into another place, the Holy of Holies, a place where God's presence, your, it's felt, it's known. And when you're in that place, there's a transformation of you. You're transformed by his presence. And so there is another whole level that God wants to bring us into. And he says, come up here, come up higher, come and be with me. And I'm going to do a divine exchange, your humanity for my divinity, your brokenness for my wholeness, your failure for my victory. You get to live in what I've done for you. You can't do it. I did it for you, but now you have to appropriate it and you have to make a choice to come up here and be with me. It's a choice. We make a choice. One mom came to me and she said, I tell my kids all the time, don't push my buttons because it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow all over you. And I said, but, but why would you tell them that? Because my day is so full and I'm so busy and they know if they get at me and get on me, I'm going to just, I'm going to baff all over them. And she doesn't mean baff physically. She means words and actions and behaviors. And I said, but why? I'm just asking questions. Why? Why does that have to happen? Because I don't have any time to be with God. And if they would just give me more time, I could be with God and it wouldn't have to be like this. I said, it's not about the children. So get up at 4 a.m. if they're up at 5 after they go to bed, spend time with God at night. Get up in the middle of the night and spend time with God. You can't blame this world or your children or the busyness or because you work. You have to make a way. If it's important to you, you have to press in. You got to come up here. You got to make a decision to come up higher. It doesn't happen because we have a good idea for it to happen. 
You have to make it happen. You have to work to make it happen. So it goes on to say verses 13 through 27 in that same chapter 43, that there's a great altar in the temple that's restored. God is restoring his altars. I don't mean coming up here with this little step and that's an altar. And I don't mean the altar in, temp in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. I mean the altar in our heart. The place in our heart where we meet with God, it's an altar. It's a, it's a holy place. The altar of God, responding to God. Chapter 44 says, the priesthood is restored. And in verse 23, this is what it says. The reason for the priesthood. And you are all, not only daughters and sons of God, but you're priests and you're kings. That's what the Bible says about you. You're a peculiar people. You are priests and kings unto the Lord. Do you understand? It's not about a pastor or an apostle or a prophet or a teacher or an evangelist and they're anointed and you're not. We are all priests and kings before the Lord. So we are to rule and reign with him. And as a priest, we're to minister to him and to one another. We have all got that same calling in different levels of responsibility, but we're all called to be kings and priests. But this is what it says. The priesthood is restored. Verse 23. They are to teach my people the difference between the holy and the common and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. I've lost count over the last 40 something years that I've been saved of ministering to people and feeling like that discernment is judgment and therefore the Bible says don't judge so therefore I can't discern. They don't understand. We are called to discern and to be able to judge fruit of whether or not a tree is good or not. And we have been so uh, deceived in thinking we're not to discern and we're not to judge. Now we don't judge someone's heart. We don't judge them and condemn them. We don't do any of that stuff. That is God's job and that's between him and them. But we have to judge the fruit of people's doings. If you came one day downtown Haverhill and saw me sitting at a bar stool with uh, mixed drinks and talking with a bunch of guys, my husband's not with me and I'm having some heavy, heavy alcohol input and I'm just carrying on and my mouth starts getting really loose and I start using words that are I wouldn't do on a Sunday morning and you walked in and saw me in that, would you discern that there was something wrong or would you say, oh, I, I can't judge that. You know, she's, she's a woman of God and that's between her and God. And then you'd still come to the church and I'd still be your pastor, right? Thank you, who said no? Thank you. No, you have the right to discern and judge someone's fruit in their life and decide whether or not you're going to drink from that river. You don't have to drink from the rivers of just everything on the internet. You need to find people that you listen to and receive impartation from that are living what they preach. And you don't know everybody on the internet is living what they preach. So you have to discern. A uh, young lady said to me, I'm listening to this uh, great, awesome teacher, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to send you the link. I listened to her, this girl, for two minutes, less than two minutes. I'll say 20 seconds. And I said, nope, not listening to her. The person came to me and said, didn't you, how'd you like that teaching? I said, I got about 20 seconds into it and I decided to shut it off. Why? I said, she's off the wall. How can you say that? She says so much stuff and it's awesome. I said, I don't care how much stuff she says that's awesome. My spirit could not receive because of this that I was discerning. What do you mean discerning? No concept of, of discernment. And so therefore we're very subject to deception because we have no discernment. The Lord wants us to be with him to discern what manner of spirit. When Jesus was speaking to uh, Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of the kingdom. Why would he say that to Peter? Because he was discerning the spirit that was speaking through Peter. You can discern the spirit <clears throat> that's speaking through others. And God will give you wisdom of what to do with that. I'm going to read to you. This is really awesome. A guy named Paul Tripp wrote this. He went to a concert. Now, how many of you know when you read the Bible that <clears throat> who was the leader of worship in heaven? What was his name before he was named Satan? He was an angel, Lucifer. 
right? So Lucifer was an instrument, his whole being. I don't know, I don't know what that looks like. Maybe Spielberg could do a movie on it, but it, his whole body was an instrument. He led worship in heaven. Don't you think that because he was displaced from that position in power, that that anointing that he was, that he was given is still at work and it's at work on the earth and it manifests through the entertainment industry. There is a strong anointing to draw young people in to a deceptive spirit through music. So what happens is the church of Jesus Christ is to be the worship on the earth and we replaced Satan's position. We're the ones that lift up worship. We're the ones that lift up the high praises of God. We're the ones that release the word of the Lord through worship and it changes atmospheres. But you know what? We don't know that. And because we don't know it and we haven't received the revelation of it and we don't do it, we don't see any results from it because we're not acting out in faith and releasing worship. There is a power in worship. And this is what he says. I love what he wrote. He says, I'll never forget this evening. I can't think of a moment when I was more blown away by a musical composition. I don't recall the composer or the conductor, but I was at a performance played by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. The music was powerful, foreboding, amazing, haunting, compelling, and glorious all at the same time. There were moments when I wished this night would never end and moments when I wanted to get up and run out of the concert hall. There were moments when the music caused my chest to rattle and moments when it lured me in with a whisper. There were moments when musical joy collided with musical fear and a beautiful disharmony of sound. When the performance was over, I felt both sad and exhausted. I wanted more and yet at the same time, I felt like I had enough. I didn't know why this particular performance was affecting me so deeply until I looked at the program and saw the name of the composition. It read, God, the most formidable word ever spoken. As amazing as it was to squeeze what is infinite into what is finite is more vastly more impossible than trying to cram the entire body of a fully developed elephant into a thimble. The composer, the conductor, and the orchestra had done marvelously well by human standards. But with their greatest effort, they only captured less than a drop of the never-ending ocean that is the glory of God. No single work of art or verbal description could ever capture glory. Glory isn't a part of God. It's all that God is. Every aspect of who God is and every part of what God does is glorious. But even that's not enough of a description. Not only is he glorious in every way, but his very glory is glorious. God's glory lives above and beyond any type of description or definition. God's glory encompasses the greatest beauty, perfection of all that he is. In everything that he is and in everything that he does, God is greater than human description. Every attribute and action of God is stunningly beautiful in every way. Each characteristic of God and every accomplishment of his hand is totally perfect. This is what we mean when we talk about God's glory. God is glorious, gloriously great. He's gloriously beautiful and gloriously perfect. There is none like him. He has no rivals and no valid comparisons can be made to him. He is the great other in a category of his own beyond our ability to estimate, understand, or describe. Every part of God is glorious in every way possible. There's nothing more to be said. And because God is glorious in every possible way, he stands alone in this vast universe as the only one who is worthy of worship surrender and love of every human heart. Beyond description. When we're in the presence of God, there is such beauty that is beyond description. And this is why the fight to keep you out of the presence of God, because once you see him, you'll never be the same. You will forever be changed. 
In the book of Daniel, Daniel was taken as a slave to Babylon to be reprogrammed as a servant of a wicked king. The king has a terrifying dream and demanded an impossible task that no one in the land could ever deliver what he demanded. Even the magicians and the sorcerers said in Daniel 2.11, what the king asked for is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except for the gods and they don't live among humans. So many people on the earth today believe that maybe there's a spirit somewhere, but he's nowhere to be found among people. And that day when I have to stand before him, if there is a God, I'll take my chances. Besides, all my friends are going to hell. I'd rather be with my friends. They have no concept, no understanding. They have nothing to even understand this great God. Excuse me, I need a tissue. Daniel 2, verse 19 through 23 says, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. What happened is the king had a dream and it terrified him. And Daniel is blessed by the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said to the king, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings. Do we believe that? He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have known, made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. He got to interpret the dream. Not only interpret the dream, but tell the king what the dream was. And that's what all the magicians and the sorcerers and the, all the, the, uh, the evil, evil doers, they couldn't tell the king what the dream was. That was the demand. I demand you, tell me what my dream was and also give me the interpretation. And Daniel said, oh, king, I can't do that, but there is one who can. Daniel 6, 3 through 4 says that this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. I want to close with this verse. Acts 17, 22 through 31. As it's coming up on the screen, I just want to say this. What did the angels announce to the good shepherds? Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. The glory of God is here and it's in us. The glory of God is here and can be seen in all of creation. The glory of God is here on the earth. If we are with him, we will see his glory. Acts 17, 22 through 31 says this, Paul stood in the midst of the Aeropagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all, breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought to not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and by man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. 
because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he appointed and ordained. He has given assurance to this to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus, the one that was raised from the dead so that we could see the Father. Jesus, the one that came as a baby in a manger. Jesus, the one that lived 33 years on the earth sinless. Jesus, the one that suffered on the cross for our sins. Jesus, the one that is coming again. Jesus, he's coming. He's coming for a church that's glorious. Do you get that? A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He's not done with the church and he hasn't come yet. So guess what, guys? You can stop praying for the rapture tomorrow to happen. Get me out of here. Beat me up, Scotty. I don't want to be here. Whoever's president next. No, we have to have a different mindset. God, until the fullness of time and your glory is revealed and covers the earth like you promised. You're coming back for a glorious church and I'm a part of that church. I am part of that offspring and that family of God. And you are doing a deep work and you want to bring us up higher so that we can know you better. And God, I am making the ascent to the high place and I'm going to come after you. I'm going to come after you with everything in me and I'm not going to be settled for what I see and what I hear on the earth. But I'm coming in and I'm coming after. And as you come in and after, guess what? The key, the door opens and you come in with him up higher and you get to see things in a different perspective. And then others think that you're too heavenly minded to be in the earthly good. Oh, uh, don't you know the science of the masks that if you don't wear, oh, don't you know the science of the unborn? Don't you know the science of God? Don't you know what God says about the things on the earth? Well, you only know what Fauci says or what the CDC says. I know what the Bible says. And so my life is not dictated and dominated by what science says. My life is dictated and I am under the subjection of the Lordship of Christ by the one who wrote the book. He's the greatest scientist ever. So we have to live life in a different perspective. So I want to invite you that to those who want more than religion, you want more than just repetitive, repetitive things and doing the same thing over and over again and feeling like you're getting nowhere. We went yesterday to Boston on the state steps in the Capitol. There was a call to a day of silence and prayer for the unborn. Do you know that the state of Massachusetts has passed a bill that was passed by our legislators that determined full term abortion right up until the day that baby is born that baby can be aborted. Do you understand what that is? It's an abomination to Almighty God. And we stood there and we brought roses and we laid them down and there's nothing we can do about these legislators other than pray and believe God for a change. So we stood there and we were with precious people, but these precious people didn't know what to say. So instead, they had their rosary beads. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And then they pray to Mary. And then they do it again and again and again. And for one whole hour, all they did was the rosary. They couldn't pray any prayers of authority or power or decree and declare or prophesy. They didn't pray for the legislators or the mamas of the, that are carrying the child or the doctors or the nurses. They didn't pray. They didn't know how to pray. And all I did, I just stood there weeping, hearing this over and over again. And I thought about the scripture that says, uh, why do you just do this repetitive prayer over and over again? And, and you, do, you don't know the one you're praying to. You, you think you do, but you're doing religious acts. And I'm not faulting Catholics. I'm going to tell you something. I came to the Lord because of a Catholic. I went to the Catholic charismatic renewal in Boston and I got healed even before I knew Jesus. I'm not faulting Catholics. What I'm saying is, do we understand that we're priests and kings? Do we understand that we're the offspring of God? Do we understand that we're here on the earth to make a difference? Do we understand that we have power and authority? We won't understand any of it if we're not spending time in the presence of God. That's all. He's coming back for a glorious church. If you want to be a part of that glorious church, I'm going to tell you something. It's not a walk for wimps. It's a painful walk. You have to die to your flesh. 
You have to die to your will and your ways and the way you were raised and the things that you uh, hold that are valuable to you. All of it has to go. When you think of Abraham and Isaac, his one son that was birthed by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit did a miracle in his wife, Sarah, and they had this son, Isaac. And the Lord says, your only son as a sacrifice to me, which was a representation of God's only son, Jesus, as a sacrifice. But we follow the Lord in his suffering, but we also follow the Lord in his victory. So there will be suffering. You will have difficulty, tribulation, and challenges. But the more time you spend in the presence of God and learning who he is, not just his word, but his ways, learning how good he is even when horrible things happen. Can you even imagine Jesus is born on the earth, right? By the time he's two years old, the king has decreed every male child to and under, kill them. Jesus comes on the scene, he's the deliverer. Now every male child to and under is killed. What a tragedy, what a horror. Whenever there's the murder of children, there is a preparation of the coming of the Lord. And I'm gonna tell you what, he's already at work and he's already here. It's just a matter of his perfect time. If you want more, I'm just gonna give you an opportunity. I've chosen some worship video that is take you into a place of worship for a few moments. If we could go ahead and play that. And I just want, I, I'm, I don't want you to come so I can pray for you. This isn't about me doing something for you. This is about you taking a step, literally. Come up here, come up here. If you want more, and if you want to know what it means to be the glorious church, you have to sit in the presence of the one who is glory. He wants you to know him. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ that when you come back for your church, it's not gonna be limping and weak and whining and complaining about who's in the White House. They're gonna be kings and priests that understand their position and their authority in Christ. They're gonna be those that know the word of God and know your ways. That's what Moses prayed. God, I wanna know your ways. Your ways are high above my ways. Your ways are high above who we are. And we, they're beyond searching and knowing unless you reveal them to us. So Father, I thank you that in the name of Jesus Christ, as your people respond to your word, that God, that you're at work making us that glorious church in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. So sometimes our internet gives us a little fit. I don't know if we can do the worship thing or not. Any head nods up, thumbs up, thumbs down. Anybody want to tell me anything back there? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That means we don't know nothing. <laughs> They're doing their best. It's not, it's the internet in here. So just sit in the presence of God. Worship. If you want to come and answer the altar call, this is between you and him. The altar call is the Lord calling his church up higher. Come up here. See, I'm even going to take a step up. Come up here. Come up here. <laughs>